Tanakoto Katoa, welcome to our second to last session of the series of ISCAST New Zealand Christians in Science Conversations. I'm Nicola Hoggard Cregan, co director of New Zealand Christians in Science. Thank you for coming and for lasting the distance. We think there have been a fascinating combination of voices from both sides of Tasman, and you have all been a great audience as well. Um, our speaker tonight, um, Grant Gillette, is Emeritus Professor of Biomedical Ethics at Otago. He has degrees in medicine and a PhD in philosophy. He has worked as a neurosurgeon and has written books on the interface of ethics, philosophy, postcolonialism, consciousness, psychiatry, and healing. In other words, he's one of the last remaining polymaths. He is a fellow of the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons and of the Royal Society of New Zealand. And he's also an advisor of New Zealand Christians in Science. With that introduction, I'll just say a brief prayer and then, we, um, then we'll begin. So let us, let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for everyone who has gathered here tonight and all those who have worked behind the scenes to organize these sessions. Let your Holy Spirit, Wairua Tapu, settle on Grant tonight as he speaks of the mysteries of consciousness and faith. And all of us as we listen and participate and learn. In the name of Christ. Amen. So over to you, Grant. Well, consciousness has been a very long focus of my cognitive engagement because I remember when I elected to do my DPhil in philosophy quite unexpectedly while we were in Oxford, I decided that I wanted to put my focus on consciousness, free will, and ethics. And given the focus one normally has for a research PhD level degree, I was very soon apprised of the fact that that might be a bridge too far. But in the end, with a little help from my friends, as Ringo Starr said, I got there. And of course, as the years go by, those friends become less and less. But among them were some of the most distinguished philosophers I have in the history of Anglo-American philosophy. So we'll start with the perspective that a neuroscientist can bring to the overlap between consciousness and cognition. And here we've got to think that a human being can be conscious of something or what I would call conscious simplicita, meaning in some inclusive or global sense. And those are different inflections of the same concept when you think about it. Because being conscious of something means you can use that thing as a cognitive focus. Being conscious simplicita means that that focus of cognition can be shifted into different points of your ethological world. And I use ethological with a TH rather than ecological with a C because ethology is interested in the way that a species inhabits and modifies its ecological niche and not just with what is in the ecological niche to start off with. And that, I believe, is the correct way to approach human cognition and belief. So when we focus on something, we can appraise it in relation to all the other objects and properties and events upon which consciousness might settle at any given time. And that appraisal creates links in our neural network, which we now realize after the neurodynamic work of the last few years, in particular using dynamic brain imaging to show 
what happens in the brain as we um, do various neurocognitive tasks, we now realize that the brain shifts its point of excitation from one re reverberating loop of interaction with the world to another, which is why we can become serially conscious of a succession of different things and yet remain holistically conscious, simplicita, of the world around us and able to have our attention seized by any particular event which has significance for our lives. For those of you who think in an evolutionary or adaptive framework, and I use the two terms because they each highlight something different, evolution, as we all know, is a biological theory. Adaptive theory is much more of a kind of general characterization of a human organism relating to its world or context and adapting to the contingencies and challenges that that world puts in its path. Now, lately, those of us interested in those rhythms in the brain and how they get us by in terms of our coping in the world or incarnation, have coined a theory which goes under the acronym ART. It's a kind of a pun because it means adaptive resonance theory. But of course, the immediate pun is art, where the whole cultural and historical and human aesthetic engagement with art is called to mind as part of our adaptive resonance with the world. Now, this neurodynamic approach has recently been championed by a thinker, a whole group of thinkers working in the tradition of Walter Freeman. Freeman infamously was the grandson of the Freeman who developed frontal lobotomy. Um, but Freeman himself, one could think as a kind of response to that terrible episode in human psychiatry, never did any vivisection at all on any animals. He spent his whole life studying the living animal. In fact, he focused a lot on the rabbit brain, uh, but his work has been applied much more widely than that. In the process of his work, he was completely averse to the idea that any animal should suffer in producing the findings that he produced. The rabbit brain is kind of quite interesting, and I've produced a reference which Freeman actually goes from his work in the rabbit, living rabbit brain and its rhythms of interaction with the world to make connections to the philosophical theology of St. Thomas Aquinas as a person who took our incarnation extremely seriously and also thought that philosophy was quite limited in the way it could deal with certain topics central to our faith, such as the incarnation of Christ and resurrection. He thought they were matters which we could only vainly try and rein in or submit to our cognitive disciplines, because that, in a sense, took away the divine, the fact that God is so much greater than anything human cognition can actually conceive of, and indeed 
with the implicit idea that to conceive of God according to one of the self-images of an age in which we live is in fact a kind of idolatry. So having reached that what I would call modest or humble conclusion about the ability of theology to truly um, limb the characteristics of God, except as they are revealed, and particularly revealed in Jesus Christ, we get on to an historical movement in Christian theology called the Via Negativa, the idea that the way of faith is almost wholly negative in terms of human conceptions of God, and yet must be also deeply spiritual in terms of the practices and commitments in relationships and feelings of Christians towards our mutual mutual or shared life in the world. I've made a tentative um, link to various passages in the Bible in my handout where for various reasons we are almost forbidden from overcognizing God, which of course the Jewish um, thinkers took very seriously. Paul himself, as you will well recall in the Areopagus address, explicitly said he had come to talk about the unknown God. So if we concede that all our pictures and anthropogenic images of God are verging on a kind of idolatry according to the culture producing them, we are indeed left with Paul's unknown God and an understanding of the deep Hebraic aversion to even naming Yahweh. At the moment, I have a Hebraic son-in-law, so I've had to think quite carefully about the proper way in which this should be um, negotiated and indeed was much moved at his wedding to my daughter when his father, who was a Jewish philosopher from Boston, um, said that they could have equally done everything they did in the perfectly orthodox Anglican service of marriage that they experienced and shared in a synagogue. That, to me, meant a great deal. I've made a reference to Balaam there, but we'll pass that by for the moment. If we um, regard the revelation we have been given humbly and existentially, we'll be quite alert to all the possible webs that cognition could spin around us and paralyze our thinking. That would be a very per perilous path where we avoided a number of dangers on the path towards true belief, very much as Bunyan recorded in A Pilgrim's Progress. Therefore, I'm going to be wary, coming from a via negativa position, of speculative um, dogma and seek a um, way that cuts through to the core of what God is telling us.
we might be reminded here, and I have in my notes of it, uh, alluded to the Gordian knot, which of course was famously encountered by Alexander in his conquest of the world. Uh, and rather than entangling himself in the no doubt fascinating business of trying to untie it, he cut it through with his sword or gladius, I suppose it was something like that. So I want to therefore examine various images of the ages that we might bring to bear on God and thereby somewhat confuse ourselves as to what should properly be asserted. So if we were to use the term omni-God, um, which I don't personally like very much, we must therefore look at the various images that we could dismiss. The image of a king, perhaps. There's certain things about the image of a king that are right, but other things that are deeply misleading. And when we see the image of a king exemplified in human history, we see all the flaws in that particular characterization. We might equally look at the modern equivalent of the boss or director of the board and all the kind of falsities and false emphases that have crept in under that metaphor. We might look at particularly financial difficulties within churches and their practices, um, which have proven to be human all to human by following that image of the corporate leader or boss. And then we might even come to the very modern image of a quantum force. Now here, I'm tempted to think, well, there's a mystery here, God and God's nature, and there's a mystery here, the fundamental nature of, of the quantum reality. And it's hugely tempting for fallible human beings to just say, well, somehow these two have got to be connected. Some of you may be involved, as I am, with a chat group that for on, you know, on internet that finds that assimilation almost irresistible and therefore multiplies mysteries that would cross a rabbi's eyes to use a line from Fiddler on the Roof. So where I have come to is to think that even though we are inevitably drawn to an attempt to cognize God as closely as we could, somehow faith has to remain intact despite that, very much in the order of Christ's blessed is he who has not seen and yet believes, which he directed at of Doubting Thomas, of course. That may seem to be foolish, particularly to those of us who are fascinated by and deeply convinced of the worth of science. We don't want mysteries at the centre of our life, but somehow or other we might find ourselves sharing what I've called here the Hebrew reticence to image God, and therefore a kind of almost scepticism, although it's not that in, term, in um, terms of its um, orientation, a scepticism about human conception and its adequacy to produce 
truth about the ground of our being and our own origins. We might therefore be forced towards something that as Anglo-American philosophers, we are always suspicious of, and that is the kind of continental term, which seems just at the point where you want it to be explicit and able to be examined from a kind of cognitive point of view, to be elusive, to slip out of our grasp, and for us not to be able to see what exactly one should hold on to and what can be treated somewhat more lightly. Although the truth that's there, although not when we get away from literal interpretation, might be deep and profound. We should remember that one of our great predecessors in struggling with what one should believe to remain true to the faith was Saul, Paul, who found that at certain points in his epistles, he had to say things in order to preserve a truth which underpinned them in a profound way, but which was hard to say literally. I mean, even at the, as I've mentioned at the beginning of the Areopagus address, he said, oh, you know, I see you've got a, 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 a statue to the unknown God. Uh, well, that's the God I'm here to proclaim. We must, therefore, as a result of the argument, attempt to show, to follow the revelation we have both humbly and existentially. In this sense, faith is, in a sense, blind. That's not just a reference, of course, to pop music, but uh, blind faith might still be regarded as inspirational in a certain kind of way. It is blind in that it acknowledges that in its certainty and sectarianism, we might, in fact, be blind, even if the actual physical manifestation of that is not visited on us for three days, so that we can contemplate our helplessness and dependence in connection with others for that time and realize how close we sail sometimes to a kind of sectarian exclusivism that is in no way consistent with the scriptures. In that way, spirit does enjoin us to dream dreams and uh, see visions. And in fact, it always must. We are always trying to grasp that which is just not quite in our face. It's in our hearts. Not quite tomorrow, but a promise for the culmination of human life, like the second coming. So in the end, we are forced back on a scandalous truth that indeed there is a prophet of God, wholly righteous, and he dies a criminal death, as Bob Dylan, himself a Jew, uh, realized and made a song about that he wanted to see the God who'd come to die a criminal death. Dying gods, in fact, 
the trope of God dying and being mortal and not immortal is found throughout our various mythologies as if they all glimpse something deeply true about that, but can't quite attach a clear form of thinking to it. So we get Balder, the bright and beautiful, was of course killed by a sprig of mistletoe, and all the gods visit Hades to try and recover him from the place of death, except, of course, for Loki. We've got the Harvest King of so many European folk traditions. We have even in our contemporary mythology the drowned god of Game of Thrones, Jon Snow himself, who dies and comes to life and whose exact birth appears to be that he is some kind of bastard or conceived in adultery or outside of marriage. And it's only relatively late in the series we find that that is in fact not the case. Of course, Jon Snow is brought back from the dead several times. We come to some of the more telling passages in which God awakens people to their short-sightedness in an attempt to tie down faith in such a way as to reject or exclude others. You will remember Elijah in the cave. What does the voice say? A still small voice that doesn't thunder or heal in the air or have a huge burst of fire. What are you doing here, Elijah? And as if that question is going to take Elijah to the heart of something that we know he has got wrong. You think that Israel has abandoned me? There are many faithful to me in Israel. And Elijah has to humbly realize that his retreat to the cave in disgust over the behavior of God's people is wrong. He's reacted wrongly. And so at last we come to resurrection completely full. I mean, you might be able to believe in lots of other things, but all of us who've lost loved ones, how can we believe in resurrection? And yet it is at the heart of the Easter faith. Somehow or other, the Easter faith revolves around resurrection, a complete foolishness to both the Greek and the Jew. And we were reminded of Sadhu Sundar Singh, the great convert who travelled to the UK to talk about his coming to faith and was asked by a reporter, so Sadhu, you were familiar with all the great mystery religions of the East and their wisdom and the way in which they had these wonderful views of human life? So whatever did you find in Christianity that was different? He said two words, only Jesus. And that, in a way, is a summary of all the conclusion that cognition has to come to in relation to the place of Christianity in our panoply of beliefs in science and other things. At the centre is only Jesus. And if it's ever otherwise, then we've lost it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Grant. I have a few questions. Um, you At the beginning, you were talking about webs of cognition and rhythm yes. of the brain. And then you were talking about the via negativa. 
which you know I, I totally agree with you. But it's almost as though we needed language to get the idea of God. But then, um, but then language leads us astray. Is that right? Well, um, in that I am a Wittgensteinian, uh, mm. and of course he himself was Jewish and famously said that he would like to believe in God, that in his heart he felt a huge sympathy for Christian belief. But when it came to spelling out what he actually believed in words and abstractions, he couldn't. He couldn't do it. Now, in his life, we see an interesting fact that his great mentor was Bertrand Russell. Now, of course, Russell is famously and almost militantly atheist. And Wittgenstein, having been um, completely tied up with Russell's philosophy of language and the fact that all of our language should be propositions based on states of affairs scientifically discovered in the world, um, departed from that, introduced concepts like language games in which we are pointed back into or drawn back into the kind of reality of embodied human life and what in games we play games, but we also enter into the complex, multifaceted relationships of language, bits of which we abstract for various purposes to isolate some feature of the world and on which we want to focus. But in so doing, we can forget that it's an abstraction and that as close as it might come to the way things actually are, at the end, every formulation of what there is in the world is an abstraction within a framework of rules that tell you what the meanings of words actually are. And so... The webs of co cognition. How do they? How do they relate to the via negativa? Ah well, now the webs of cognition are, are fashioned like webs by hooking on to various bits of the world, just the way a spider's web hooks on to various bits of the world, and allowing us to move between them, and also serve the adaptive purpose of relating us to nutrition and everything else. The via negativa is a way of saying, well, all that kind of thinking is great for actual incarnate things in the world of flesh, if you like. But God is something else, the ground of our being, not an object among beings. Therefore, to try and find the best, of it, the best of our concepts and conceptions of objects which might apply to God is to make a mistake, to, to leave the ground of our being and venture into the world of reference and description in order to find some worldly image which we think might be applicable at this particular point in, in human history. And they all carry with them cultural baggage and cultural assumptions. Thank you for all that. Very stimulating. My question is, a comment really, that Jesus used images of God, a notable one being Father. And in the Old Testament, was the image of judge. Would you like to yeah. comment on that? Yes. Well, we are forced to. Those images relate us to the world. Um, I'm reminded of that wonderful line in the um, film in which Tom Hanks 
acted as a gangster's child. And he puzzled over what he felt about his father at a certain point. And, you know, we all have a common conception of father that we would think is perfectly transparent. But in reality, the whole father thing, although it's close, it's close in certain respects to one's relationship to God. And it is misleading in another. So certain aspects of orthodox faith, using orthodox in the technical rather than the um, anthropological sense, um, point to the fatherhood of God, point to our realising that we have sprung from a being who can be loved and related to and understand and the depths, even feel the depths of human feeling. And yet the moment we try to overdo it, over egg it, as an Oxford person might have said, um, we somehow distort what's going on. Jesus qualified it, of course, by phrases such as how much more will your Father in heaven, comparing Jesus, the picture of God, with our reality? Then. Jesus' incarnation was, in human relational terms, as everybody must realize when they read it, deeply problematic in terms of the accepted arrangements in society that we take to reify commitment and attachment and all that, there's something wrong there about Jesus. We realise that at a certain point, a huge amount is being asked of Joseph when Mary becomes pregnant. And according to the New Testament, uh, he is not the father, the actual father, because God is the father. Now, when the moment you think about that in terms of modern society, that the woman you've committed yourself to and kind of signal that you're going to enter into marriage to is having a child but which is not your child, you realise what an absolutely huge ask that was that God had delivered into Joseph's life. It's almost impossible as a normal human being with normal loving human relations to feel, to understand or empathise with what Joseph must have gone through, you know. Uh, and we find that the Bible challenges us repeatedly to do things like that at various points we are made to question the most fundamental aspects of our human life and to ask whether some of the abstractions that we write over those aspects of life in fact conceal nearly as much as they reveal so is this a um um, an argument then for non-verbal prayer, for meditative prayer, Grant? Well, I think um, verbal prayer can be a um, distraction sometimes, I think. But when we raise our children, they learn to speak, and then they learn in the right setting that something very deep is going on under that communication, particularly in relation to the appearance. And they learn that those speaking may be part of it. It is only part of it. And I think Christians can become the same with spoken prayer. Yes, there's all sorts of prompts to our neural circuits and spoken prayer as we all know from the lord's prayer and 
the other prayers that we learn by heart. And they direct our minds to contemplate our own lives in a certain kind of a way. And if you're at all like me, you find that in a liturgy or any other service, um, at certain points, your heart and mind touch the spiritual reality that you're engaged in at that time, sometimes to the point of really overwhelming you. Um, and for no reason that you can actually cognize but may deeply appreciate, at that point in the prayer, you feel almost emotionally at sea, as if you might drown. But it's a kind of drowning in faith uh, evoked by a particular point at which that prayer has touched your neurocognitive system and set in motion a rhythm or reverberation or resonance which links you to all kinds of things that you would find hard to actually clearly put in orthodox doctrine. And again, I'm using orthodox, not in a sectarian sense. Mm. Or at least if you like me, sometimes even it's a perfectly familiar hymn. Suddenly, a, a word, a phrase in it grabs you. And just think, gee, I've never fully understood that before. And you don't, of course, understand it. You are just seized by it. And you find yourself once again contemplating the mystery of God, but from a different point of view uh, than what you previously occupied. Um, yeah. When you speak about, uh, you know, man assigning name or assigning um, the, uh, you know, definitions of God and all of that, it, appear, it, it, it makes me think that it's in a frame that has a particular presupposition about truth, which is really more um, that which is correspondence or um, coherence theories of truth um, in which we enter into a relationship between, well, you, you actually made the definition, the state of affairs, which is, and I think what I hear you saying or what's resonating with me is, is, is something that I'm thinking a lot about, which is going back to the, you know, the pre, um, the pre, uh, uh, well, before Plato, the, the, the pre-Socratics and the idea of aletheia. And so this idea that Actually, what we're experiencing is something that we're not necessarily putting something in, we're receiving. So there's this opening up and disclosure of truth because it's not truth about something, which then, you know, kind of came through the last 2000 years and what we then carried on. And that's how we in the West speak about God. We have to come up with something that corresponds and that's impossible. We don't know as opposed to receiving. So the participation, it, it seems to me, is actually in the reception. And that brings on this theomazia, this, or however you pronounce it, I'm not good at the Greek pronunciation, but this idea of wonder, this moment of awe and wonder, which puts us in the place to hear. So it's more about receiving than putting something in. And then we're not accused of anthropomorphizing or reifying. We are receiving yeah. truth as it is disclosed. So it's truth ex disclosing itself. And, and connected to one other thing you said, which is very moving to me, because I'm probably one of these people that's sort of at the moment embracing the quantum, because it seems that that's speaking into the sort of neo-pagan new world of thinking. And this science of the quantum seems to be something that if we accept it aletheically, it's actually truth revealing itself. So it doesn't have to be idolatry. It's just the revelation of what is, and that is, maybe showing us the logos in a way that the Western mind that has to go the other way cannot accept. So I don't know if, if, that, if looking at the way we see truth may be a way of talking about this. Anyway, that's some... some um, it's a very interesting reflection. No, I think you've hit on something absolutely fundamental. 
the difference between receiving and dwelling in a truth and formulating it, uh, the latter of which is a human exercise. And I must say in uh, Anglo-American philosophy has always been thought of in the way you mention as representation. Whereas I think in faith, we are deeply entangled in reception, as you say, um, and then trying to turn that reception with all its elusiveness in terms of our cognitive categories into representation is where we tend to go wrong. In fact, the first book I published through Oxford was called Representation, Meaning and Thought and very much spelt out what you just outlined very briefly, that the business of human thought does begin with a kind of idea of representation, which links to the meanings of language and which is the basis of our thought. But in that book, even, and I wrote it 30 years ago, um, I kind of reached a point where I sketched the limitations of that, even though the theory at the time was very much based in the idea of accurate representation of states of affairs as being the absolute basis of all language. And in the book, there was a kind of reservation about that, showing that although he had these apparently precise ways of characterizing human thoughts and their meaning, when we actually look at them, we often end up at a point where we find ourselves enmeshed in a paradox and that that should be an indication which directs us otherwise than in that overly specifying, in our terms, direction. Mm. So you put your finger right on the number of the thing, I think. Yeah. Needless I, to say, the book I'm currently working on is even more um, uh, critical of that overly precise, Fragian and Russellian view of meaning and human life. Yeah. I've also put in the chat... Um, the link to the Boyle Lecture this year by Rowan Williams, which is also on this topic. Um, well, and, Rowan would do that well, I yeah, think. Yeah, he, he did. Yeah, that was great. Um, okay, um, Richard, you've got a question. Yes, Grant and Nancy, just picking up on your conversation and tapping back into neuroscience, um, what are your thoughts, Grant, with regard to the word believing? What do we mean by believing? How much of that is about cognition, language, left brain? How much of it's about reception and right brain? Well, believing is a very interesting term because as an Anglican, uh, I think we there is a kind of sense of belief which is a little less like the formulated beliefs of a scientific inclusion of an experiment. And believing becomes a much more all-in thing which involves this kind of broader commitment of life and ethos of one's life and affect in one's life. They're all tied up with the kind of believing that one does as a Christian, and they all affect one another. So that, that at a certain point, you're forced to say time after time, well, I don't know, there's something right about that, but it isn't obviously apparent at first glance. And sometimes you do have to reflect and meditate on what it is that has been said, which has the ring of truth to use 
that metaphor about it, but it's a truth that could be mistaken if it was interpreted in a certain kind of a way. So there's a lot of hermeneutics and interpretation in my current approach to cognition. Whereas at the phase when I went to Oxford and uh, was busy trying to sort out in the brain exactly the abnormality we'd seen on the MRI scan uh, and, uh, and destroy the abnormality without destroying the brain around it had a much more representational and uh, precise uh, kind of scientific um, or correspondence as has been used version of the truth. Just a comment, that speaking as another Anglican, the use of music in worship and Wonderful. at the same time Anglicans stand up and recite creeds. That's the left brain and the we right do. brain thing as I see it. <laughs> well, I... I think it's more than that. I think even our left brain, well, they usually accept when we are submitting the person who's a whole person to a callosotomy, usually the left and right brain are working closely in harmony with one of them more linked to much more linguistic and structured kind of approaches and the other a much more fluid and interactive approach which resists ultimate um, abstraction and the fact that they do both work together and combine in an extremely interesting way to give us a unified life in the world is I think deeply informative. So I'm not a great fan of um, over-localization, as indeed was the case for Hewlings Jackson, the father of neurology as we know it in Britain, uh, who of course was totally convinced uh, by the objective findings, but also deeply interested in a much more integrative um, approach to human neurocognition. Mm. I was going to say it's, um, it's Ian McGilchrist who is the one who's speaking at great length these days about the bipartite brain. Well, it isn't as bipartite as all that, unless you do something to stop it communicating with itself such as a callosotomy. Well, he, even, he would say that it was just our civilization that was stopping it. But anyway, that's another, that's a conversation for another that's day. That's another whole conversation. <laughs> yes. Often so can I decide? So, so yes. I just add and, one thing. Yes, one yes. thing, and relate, relating to um, Richard's comment, one thing I, I also think about this is that um, the, the, in the different, different disciplines, particularly neuroscience or the science, the hard sciences, we're forced to, or I think anyway, to because my my background is um, philosophical theology, but I think we're forced to 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 use uh, the um, uh, traditional or classic forms of logic, and when we get into these kinds of discussions, we have to open up and allow for the non-classical or the included middle, and uh, that's a big issue, and it's, it's a it's a real big issue when science and religion are having a conversation. So even in terms of like neuroscience, some of those things, if that going up to that next level of reality where you allow for those kinds of um, discussions that include both and. That's just, you know, kind of goes along with truth, but it's also one of the issues that we have to struggle with because it, it, we as Christians um, kind of deal in both and all the time. But then when we get into our confessions, and it's particularly in the West, and I'm coming from an Eastern perspective, Eastern Orthodoxy, then um, you, but we're forced to then speak in terms of classical logic and I just think that's one thing to kind of think about when we're having these kind of conversations about consciousness um, uh, in the science side to add for the non-classical forms of logic just in a, another additional thought. Great well thank you so much everybody for your um, thoughts and questions and comments and thank you so much Grant for um, this wonderful presentation which sort of is always pushing us to see something just beyond what's 
immediately there. And so we yeah. thank you very much for that. Can I ask um, Grace to finish our evening, our official evening um, with prayer? Thanks, Grace. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the blessing of the day that has passed. We thank you for the provision of food, shelter, and fellowship. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together, to listen, to marvel, and to question. We thank you for Grant, for his years of research, and for the generosity of his time this evening. May our hearts always receive such gifts with humility and thankfulness. And to close, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.